Well, hey folks, globally, it's estimated that more than 1 billion children experience some form of abuse every single year. This includes physical abuse, sexual and emotional abuse. Did you know that as many as one in five girls and one in 13 boys experience sexual abuse during their childhood? These numbers are likely underreported due to the stigma, the lack of reporting mechanisms, and other barriers that prevent children from speaking out. Well, let's talk about a center where children can safely share what crimes have happened against them. Well, hey everybody, welcome back to our channel. As many of you know, we've been anxiously awaiting the grand opening of a new Children's Justice Center in Northern Utah. Now across the country, these are known as Children's Advocacy Centers. We've made numerous donations here at Profiling Evil to this new center, and I'm gonna surprise the director with another check at the end of this video. Now I'm gonna do it at the conclusion of a special tour that the director has arranged for me and my friend Reed Richards, the brainchild of the Children's Justice Centers in Utah. Together, we toured the building, which is currently under construction. And it was so exciting to see the new facility and walk the floors of what will be a state-of-the-art location designed to help child victims. Hey everybody, I'm standing here with former Commissioner Joan Hellstrom, a longtime friend yes. who actually was with us in the beginnings of the Children's Justice Center movement. And Joni, just what, what are your thoughts when you come here and, and see what happened today? I'm very emotional because Reed, you, all of us knew we had to do interview and investigation different for our children. And knowing about the Children's Justice Center and learning about the model, and when it came to fruition for Weber County as the first one that had a Children's Justice Center, I knew what was behind those doors that was going to make a difference in the way we interviewed and investigated children that have been abused. And so I really am emotional about it and knowing how it's grown under the leadership of all of us. Mike, you never gave up. Reed, everybody got together. Greta Peterson was absolutely the grandmother of the center I always want to recognize her because she was the one that served on the jury of a child abuse case and went to Norm Bangader and said, we have to do something different. And Reed already had that vision and felt it was important to do that. And they put that task force together and they went out and found a grandmother's house and brought it back. And Weber County had the first one. And we had a severe case that had taken two years to come before a courtroom. And when she did the ribbon cutting, she also said the same thing. I know what's there for the children now that wasn't there for me. And it's important that I am here to do the ribbon cutting, to know that it's gonna make a difference for children always, because it'll be there. And so those are the things I remember, and I wonder where a lot of them are now. And so it was just beyond even what I even imagined, and still is. And I'm so proud of everybody that came together as a team because like Mar Margaret Mead says, but she said it takes all of us to make a difference. And I'm gonna to be touring and chatting with former Chief Deputy Attorney General, Reed Richards. He and I worked together for many, many years and we're joined by the director of this amazing center, Rod Layton. His vision for this amazing building is gonna be the pinnacle of his 40-year law enforcement career. Well, I'm here with Reed Richards, the former county attorney that actually is the brainchild of this center that's behind us. I think back, Reed, it was uh, 35, almost Would have been about 1989, ago. thereabouts. Uh, came up with yep. the idea that we needed to have a center for children that, where they could be physically and forensically examined as part of the court process if they end up being victimized by sexual or physical abuse or emotional abuse. Rod Layton, who we all had the opportunity to work together. Rod and I worked as police officers for the county attorney. And uh, <laughs> we've uh, maintained our friendship over the years. Rod 
has uh, been in charge and the director of the Children's Justice Center for as long as I can remember now, Rod. It's Tell been it's been probably 20 years, hasn't 20, it? 22 years. 22 years. <laughs> 22 yeah. years. I was so finished a law enforcement <laughs> career, went on to uh, work another 20 years for, for uh, the people of the state. But Rod Reed, tell them a little bit about what the center is and what it means to you, kind of to see it. We just finished touring it today, which was really fun. Well, you know that the center is a, uh, a place that we don't house children. What we do is bring them here if they've uh, been abused, uh, and they go through an interview process, and we record that interview so that it can be used any time it's needed. It could be in court, could be by uh, law enforcement officers, it could be by a doctor, so we don't have to talk to them time and time again about what happened. Uh, they also, as, uh, and by the way, they're interviewed with a, by a person who's trained to interview kids, a forensic interviewer we call them, uh, so that we know that the interview is, is quality and doesn't do things that would get it thrown out of court. Uh, and for the most part, it, it ends up being used in court or before court, and most of those cases settle without the child ever having to testify in court. Uh, and that was one of the main objectives. We're trying to reduce the trauma to the kids. Uh, but while they're here, they also get a number of other services. Rod, tell us about those. Uh, we have a full medical unit. So after the interview, that we'll sit down with our nurses. We have a nurse practitioner and an RN, registered nurse. And we will go over what the disclosure was. If the disclosure indicates that we need to do a medical exam, then we have very qualified nurses where we can do those exams. They don't need to go to emergency room. They don't need to go to, you know, anywhere else. We'll do them here on site. Uh, very well trained. It's just um, talked a little bit about reducing that trauma, and that's what we're trying to do with the forensic interviewers, with the nurse, with the nurses, uh, with our coordinators. We're just trying to reduce the trauma, and we're successful at that. We can reduce the trauma substantially by having a building like this and, and how that functions and, and having the, the right people there. The other thing that we do, in the, well a couple of other things, one uh, if they need psychiatric help we can provide that either on site possibly and certainly off site and we can make sure that uh, that's paid for by those that can't afford to, to have it done themselves, don't have insurance. Uh, but the other big thing that's done in this building is what we call the interdisciplinary uh, council discussion. So when it comes to prosecuting the case and taking it through the criminal justice system, uh, all of the parties that might have an interest in it can meet here, and they do that regularly every week, yep. uh, and review uh, what can be best done to make sure the case is solid, but also to make sure that the, the child uh, recovers from the trauma to the extent that we can uh, make that happen, from the trauma that they've gone through. Uh, and so you'll have uh, attorneys here. Uh, you'll have police officers here, you'll have uh, Division of Child and Family Services representatives here. Uh, you might have the medical people there if there's a, a medical issue. Uh, you'll have uh, possibly people from the schools that may need to interact to help the child get back into, into school or into education. So anyone that might have a, an impact on that child's life and help that child get back to normal, uh, we invite to these disciplinary, interdisciplinary councils. Uh, and they add a great deal to the value of the building and the value of the service that we provide to the kids. You know, to me that's a pretty remarkable thing. Not only <clears throat> are the children brought in and it's a, done very discreetly, they're not sh uh, showcased, the public doesn't see them wandering mm -hmm. in and out. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very nice, quiet place that's out of the way. And, and as we're talking, I'm actually showing some imagery that we flew today with the drone of, of where the building is today. But maybe, Rod, you could give everybody because many of these people have donated toward it either through buying the book Deceived or through direct donations. Um, but maybe yeah. give an idea of when we're planning on the, the open of this center. Yeah, we, um, we're shooting for the end of March, uh, April. Um, one of the reasons we're that far out, I think we may be able to finish it even quicker than that, is we is the weather. Obviously that's going to dictate when we can do our asphalt, our landscaping. and So we just decided to wait a little longer to open so that our we have the right temperatures to, to make those right. Uh, you know, asphalt, if you're not 50 degrees when you do that, then it's going to last, you know, three years versus, you know, 20 years if we do it at the right temperatures. So 
you know, we're not we're not in a hurry to get it done, and so we can just move in. We want it to be done right, and we want it to last. So that that's probably what we're looking at sometime in April. We're, we're pretty excited about a couple of the guests that we're going to be bringing in, Reed. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, but yeah. Let me. Well, let me talk about one other thing first, yeah. and then let's get to the the open house and the little kickoff. Uh, when we started the center 30 years ago or 35 years ago, uh, we were the first one in in Utah, and there were uh, some small centers around the country, but I think we were, oh, maybe I we were number two. 15 or 20th in, oh, the, in, in the nation. country. In the country. Yeah, wow. And uh, since that time, uh, these are so effective, these children's justice centers, and, and so helpful to the kids that now we have, what, 30 or so uh, around the state? Yeah, in, in Utah. In Utah. And then uh, so pretty much anywhere in the state, you have access to a children's justice center. Not not yep. the, the quality or magnitude of this one, but uh, but a center. Some in the in the small areas are very small, just a small house. The idea was to take a child to a place that is not intimidating. It's not an office building. Uh, it's just a place that originally was a was a home, and now it's a big home. <laughs> but it also also will look like they're they're going into a, a home, not into a an office building, and that also helps with the trauma. One of the first Anything to add to that, Rod? Uh, no, that was a, a lot of talk and hours went into that because it really does matter, you know, where the location of the building is. You know, if it's if it's quiet, if it's peaceful, it's easy to get to, no traffic, easy parking. You know, we we look at all of that. It's not just throw a building up somewhere. And and one of the things that we like is the privacy of this, you know, of you know where the CJC's at. So we spent a good two years looking for just the right piece of property. So all of that comes into play when you're when you're putting one of these together. Back when we initially started the center, one of the first uh, clients, I guess that's a way to call them, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. one of the first group of people to use the, the center were the victims of the Zion Society, Arvin Shreve's cult group in North Ogden. Uh, Mike's written a book about that and has done a lot of interviews about it. Uh, but. Uh, there were a, a, a number of victims. Uh, they were children, both boys and girls, uh, and that would have been 30 years, maybe 35 years ago now. Yeah. Uh, and so those children that were little tiny kids as they went to that Children's Justice Center years ago are now adults. Uh, and so at the opening, uh, we anticipate having uh, many of those, uh, they're not young people anymore, <laughs> but many, no. many of those uh, men and women uh, who were some of our first serviced victims uh, come back and, and see the center, uh, see what they kind of helped start, uh, and share some of the thoughts that they've had about uh, recovering from child abuse. And Mike's worked closely with all of those uh, folks and uh, has a good rapport with all of them. Well, it's been really successful. And <clears throat> a few months ago, I spoke at CrimeCon, which I can't even begin to describe what CrimeCon is like. I mean, it's 6,000 people who want to hear and learn more about true crime and and while I was there I spoke about the Zion Society case but I um, I encouraged the the people that were in attendance and in my session alone there were more than 3,000 people in that session uh, to go to their nearest Children's Justice Center and make a donation and send me a note back on that and we have had people all across the United States reaching out to Children's Justice Centers but we've also had many of them know that money is coming directly to you and this building opportunity, Rod, and you've received a number of checks from us at, at Profiling yes. Evil. And, and while I was at CrimeCon, I was uh, participating in a panel with a woman uh, who is a behavioral expert named Susan Constantine. And she has a brand new book that's coming out called How to Tell a Liar in Seven Seconds or Less. <laughs> and it is a brilliant book. She invited me to participate in one of the chapters of that book. And uh, so as that book comes out, I want you all to buy Susan's book. And I want to thank Susan. But she demanded that she pay me for my time in helping on the chapter that I worked on. And uh, we came up with a little uh, process, Rod, that I wanted to just present to you. Rather than take that, we thought it would be best to just forward it on to you and to the building wow. fund here. And so a thanks and a shout out to Susan. And uh, I'm honored to be able to push that money your way as we have, I think, many other times and we'll yeah. continue to do. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mike. I, you know, we really appreciate this because when I get funds like this, there's no strings attached to it. So a lot of times I get 
you know, a donation. It's like, I, I want you to spend it on this and this, and that kind of ties our hand a little bit. So with these, these kind of funds, we can, we can just use it for what we need, and we will always make sure it goes directly to a child. But sometimes, if it's very specific on what we use it for, then sometimes we, it's not as effective. So we love these kind of donations. So thank you, Susan. Yeah. Appreciate well, there you that go, so folks. much. And, and if you choose to make donations to this, and I've asked you many times to do so, just when in the link, put that you would like it to go to the Children's Justice Center, and we'll pass it through onto the center and onto the kids to, to support them. But yes. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm used to doing this. I'm going to leave the final word to read, Rod, but anything you'd like to answer, and then I'm going to turn to my boss for many, many decades <laughs> and uh, ask him to take a couple of words because... Mm. None of this really, really would have happened without you, Reed. Yeah. So yeah. nobody's Mike King's boss. I found that out. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he just he, says that. He, 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 he hooks into something and he doesn't let go, and that's that's why he's been so successful as an investigator, and particularly in this case. If you haven't read his book, you ought to take the opportunity to do that. Uh, it talks about how the the whole case came about and how it was investigated, and uh, that uh, it's called deceived. 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 Uh, great opportunity, but. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, far too long in the, in the criminal justice system, we've uh, focused on how do we punish violators, and that's always going to be important. Uh, but you know, it's not nearly as important as how do we help the victim of that crime recover so that they can get back to normal life. Uh, and this is one of uh, many steps, but a big step in trying to, to do that for child victims. Uh, the opportunity to try to change things so that uh, we can make things better for those who go through that traumatic experience of being a crime victim uh, is worth all over time and effort and, and Mike's been a good effort uh, doer in that regard and, and so is Rod. Yeah. And Rod? Yeah, I, I, you know one thing I found we've been working on this now for five years and one thing that I really noticed is the community and people all come together when it's this kind of a, a project. It's just there's no negative word said about it it's like let's get this done it's it's that important so it can work when communities come together on certain things and this is one of them that's it's just a pleasure to work on because it's all it's all this needs to be done i get no no pushback i guess is the word on something like this it's like yeah let's go forward what do you need so that, that's been really nice well thanks fellas and folks remember you can find profiling evil on facebook instagram youtube twitter and uh, if you like audio podcasts, make sure you're checking out Profiling Evil Podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. So from the new Children's Justice Center in Northern Utah, thanks so much. We'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.